Suci Putra Atra Surupam Rupam Tasya Graja Muri Puri Maturin Chavi Sundrai Tas my Maha Primaras of Pradhai Chaitan Yachandra Yanamonamas Chaitan Yachandra Yanamonamas Chaitan Yachandra Yanamonamas Sham Sundar Shikanda Shikar Smaha Sumurili Manora Radikar Sikamam Kripanidhi so priya chana king kurin kuru tavayvasmi tavayvasmi na jivami tayabina iti vikaya devi tam namam chanantikam first of all i offer my sister in dandavat puspanjali my heart like flowers thousands of times at the lotus feet of my holy master, my supremely worshipable spiritual Gurudev, Asmadiya Parmaraja Tamaguru Pada Padma, Nitilila Pravishta Om Mishnupad, Ashto Tarasatasi Rupa Nuga Charyavarya, Sila Bhakti Vedanta Narayan Goswami Maharaj. Secondly, I offer my pranam thousands of times at the lotus feet of my Param Gurudev and to Srila Prabhupada and to all of our Sri Rupanuga Gaudiya Guru Parampara. And finally, I offer my pranam to all the assembled Vaishnavas and Vaishnavis. By the courses mercy of Sri Guru and Gauranga. Last week we were discussing uh, Bhagavad Gita, chapter 9, up to verse 27, yet Karosi, Yadasnasi, Yajohosi, Dadasi, Yatapasyasi, Tukuntaya, Tat Krishna Madarpanam. See, Krishna is saying, whatever you do, whatever you mm, offer or give away, whatever sacrifices you perform, whatever austerities you perform, then whatever charity you give, also you should do that as an offering to me. So now in verse 28, uh, see Krishna is explaining what will be the result of this. So Krishna has recommended to Arjuna that previously I told you, Kamani Vadikaras te ma paleshu kadachana na kama falahitu bu mate sangos karmani you have the adhikar the eligibility to perform karma to perform your duties but you are not entitled to the fruit of action never consider yourself to be the cause of the results of your activities and also don't be attached to not doing your duty so this was the prescription of uh, Sri Krishna to Arjun earlier in Bhagavad Gita how to perform one's prescribed duties without meditating on the results in other words without being agitated by passion anticipation for some future enjoyment not considering yourself to be the cause of the result of activities knowing that 
though we are acting now, the result that comes from our action is the fruit of previous life's activities. Mm-hmm. And one may say, well, if I cannot enjoy the fruit of my activity, and if I cannot enjoy the satisfaction of thinking, I have done it, then why do the mm, duties at all? So Krishna says, Mate Sangosva Karmani, also don't give up your duties. Why? Because the purpose of this uh, Nishkam Karma Yoga is uh, to rise up, it is purification, to rise up from Tamagun, Rajagun and up to Sattvagun because in the in the state of Sattvagun then Gyan comes, knowledge arises by itself. The Vivek, the discrimination between Atma and Anatma, what is the soul and what is not the soul. The, discrip- the discrimination between matter and spirit uh, rises up. So, now, in the verse we discussed last week, Yat Karosi, Yadasnasi, etc. See, Krishna is saying, O oh Arjun, you are more qualified than what I have said before. Uh, just to do karma, you can do the Bhagavad Arpita Nishkam Karma Jnana Mishra Pradani Bhuta Bhakti. Right? This seems like a very long phrase, so we'll just break it down step by step. First of all, uh, it is Pradani Bhuta Bhakti. That means that in your life you are engaged in practicing bhakti, hearing, chanting, and remembering, but you are also doing your worldly activities in terms of your responsibilities related to your physical body and mind. So, when a person is uh, performing their uh, karma and their jnana, but also with bhakti, but bhakti is predominating, and they're acting without attachment for result, then this is called nishkam. That means nishkam, not desiring the results. Karma, gyan, mishra, pradani bhuta bhakti. And it is also a Bhagavata arpita. That means everything is offered to the Supreme Lord. And that is the recommendation Krishna has given in the previous verse. And in this verse that we're discussing today, Sri Krishna is describing what result will come by following this path, by acting in this way in your life. And it's a very um, significant result. So here he's saying, Shubha Shubha Falar Evam Mokshase Karma Bandhanai Sanyasa Yoga Yuktatma Vimukto Mam Upaisyasi In this way, Moksha say karma bandhana. Evam means in this way. Moksha say karma bandhana. You will become free from the bondage of karma. Hmm. What type of karma? One may say, a person may want to become free from the um, reactions of impious activities because they produce suffering. But here Krishna is saying, Shubha, Shubha, Faler, Evam. You become free from the reactions of the impious activities that bring suffering. And you will also become free from the reactions of pious activities that bring future happiness. So this is very important. Because even if a person only performs pious activities, it will produce the... the um, relatively pleasant material karma in the future. But still, the soul will have to take birth in order to taste uh, that material happiness. And uh, that is... That material happiness is not really happiness. From the point of view of a liberated person, then even material happiness is considered to be suffering because it is um, coming from maya. It is uh, not the happiness of the soul. And the material happiness causes one to become more attached again to the material world. 
So it's also very dangerous. So see, Krishna is explaining here very beautifully how if you follow the prescription given in the previous verse, then all your good karma and bad karma, you'll be liberated from that. And uh, in this way, sannyas yoga yuktatma vimukto mamu paisasi, which means that uh, you will be liberated. Your soul, your uh, mind will be in sannyas yoga. That means you become completely detached from this material plane and vimukto, you will become liberated and mam upaisasi, you will uh, attain me. So, here the word vimukta has been used. Not mukta, you will not become only uh, mukta, liberated, but you will become vimukta. That means you become a pure devotee. As the influence of the past karmas goes away, then gradually, gradually, the situation will come where your mind has no uh, relationship to the external activities of this world and one will become fully uh, engaged in bhakti. So then it will no longer be karma, jnana, mishra, pradani bhuta bhakti, but it will just be bhakti. Uh, bhakti which is not mixed with anything. However, we should know that it will be um, bhakti which is predominated by Aishwarya Gyan, knowledge of Sri Krishna's opulences. So, one of the important features of this verse is the word vimukto. You will become vimukta. Mukta means liberated and vimukta means vishesh especially liberated. In other words, among many liberated persons, you will be extraordinary. Why is that? In Bhagavad Gita, see, uh, Krishna has said that Manushyanam sasreshu kastid yatati siddhaye yatatam apisiddhanam kastin mamveti tattvataha Out of many thousands of men, Hardly one of them strives for perfection of being liberated. But out of many thousands of liberated persons, oh, hardly one knows me in truth. In Srimad Bhagavatam, also, um, Lord Shiva has said, Muktanam apisiddhanam narayanaha parayanaha sudurlabha prashantatma kotishwapi mahamune out of many millions and millions of liberated persons, it is very hard to find one who is absorbed in devotional service to Supreme Lord Bhagavan, to Lord Narayan. Such person is very rare and their heart is completely peaceful. So, also, Shukadev Goswami has said, Muktim dadati kahi chitsmana bhakti yoga Sri Krishna very easily gives liberation to those who worship Him, but He does not give bhakti. So pure devotional service, to attain the platform of pure devotion and uh, uh, enter into the spiritual world in the service of the Supreme Lord is far superior to liberation. This point is being established here. Some persons think that uh, bhakti is a method to get liberation. But here, see, Krishna is emphasizing that the bhakti is practiced here and one attains the eternal pure bhakti in the spiritual world, which is superior to liberation. So now we're moving on to the next verse, which is extremely important of Bhagavad Gita. Verse 29. Sammoham sarvabhuteshu name dvesyostina priyaha ye bhajanti tumam bhaktya mai te te shu chapyaham. Here, see, Krishna is saying, Samoham Sarvabhuteshu Name Dvaisteostina Priya. The reason Krishna is saying this, I am equally disposed to all living entities. No one is um, uh, very, uh, I don't show favor to one and I am not envious towards another. The reason he's saying this is 
because Krishna has pre previously spoken about uh, Karma Yoga and the Jnana Yoga. He's spoken about those who worship the demigods and so on. But only those who are practicing Pradhani Bhuta Bhakti, who gradually become purified and attain pure Bhakti, can come to Him. So it seems that He's favoring uh, those persons. Um, because Krishna is famous by the name Bhakta Vatsala, one who is very um, affectionate, like a parent, towards His devotees. So Krishna is not known as Jnani Vatsala, Yogi Vatsala, <laughs> He is not the Vatsala of the uh, very affectionate to the devotees of Durga or, or Rudra or other demigods and so on. He is known as Bhakta Vatsala, affectionate to his own devotees. And therefore it seems that Krishna must have some type of partiality. In addition to that, we see that in life, in our practical life in the world, someone is blessed with uh, beauty, someone is... Uh, ugly, someone is very healthy, someone is very uh, unhealthy, someone is wealthy, someone is in poverty, someone has a long life, someone has a short life, and so on. So there's just no equality anywhere in the world in terms of one's uh, birth or circumstances or abilities. It just doesn't exist. And so seeing this inequality everywhere, and knowing that God is the creator of the world, then one could level the accusation at God that uh, you, you are partial, you must like this person and, and dislike that, that person. Now a common person may think of God in those very um, fallible human-like terms. Uh, but for the philosophers it's important that God is actually impartial. And the reason is, is this, because the world of Maya, the world of illusion, is full of duality, whereas God is uh, understood to be beyond duality, Advaita, the Advaigyan Paratattva. So if God can be um, moved emotionally by the worldly activities of the people and become pleased with some and become angry towards others, this very type of um, anthropomorphic conception of God, then that conception of God cannot be the absolute truth, according to philosophers who consider the ultimate truth to be Advaita, beyond worldly dualities. So Krishna, in this verse, he's establishing that, yes, it's true, I am the Advaya Paratattva, the non-dual absolute truth. And even though it may look that as if I'm favoring some people and um, discriminating against others, but actually, some hoham sarva bhuteshu name dvestostina priya. I am equal to all, I don't show favor to some, and I don't act uh, enviously towards anyone. So, in the commentary on this verse, Sil Bhaktinod Thakur is quoting a verse that was spoken by Chitraketu Maharaj in the sixth canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, where he says, Na tasikas chit daita pratipo na gyati bando na paro na cha swaha samasya sarvasa niranjanasya sukena raga kuta eva rosha. Here, Chitraketu Maharaj is saying, The Supreme Lord is equal to all beings. There is no one who is dear or no one who is not dear to Him. Mm -hmm. So it's very similar to Krishna's words here in Bhagavad Gita. Now he's making an argument that mm, since a detached person has no attraction to sense pleasures, how can he become angry when his sense pleasure is disturbed? So the important point here is that some persons think, oh, God is in the sky, and when he sees that we're doing something wrong, he becomes angry, and then psh, he'll send a thunderbolt to, uh, to curse us. So, Chitraketu Maharaj is saying, look, if there's a sadhu in this world, he's detached from the experience of happiness and distress. 
because his mind is very steady. This is something that has to be uh, understood clearly. The our chitta, that is the the stuff of the mind, the 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 fabric of your psyche, if you like, that is called chitta, and the chitta expands and contracts within the ether. So ether is called ka or akash. So when the chitta expands in the akash, then you uh, feel um, your mind is expanding and illu being illuminated and you feel good. So when there is the sukha, beautiful akash, the mind is spread out in the akash, that's called in Sanskrit sukha. And the English word is happiness. But the English word happiness doesn't tell us ontologically what's really going on. Sukha means that our chitta as sukha became the expanded in ka, in the akash. So we feel uh, relaxed and, and peaceful. And what is distress? Dukha. That means that the consciousness has contracted and that makes all of our um, thinking processes become uh, very difficult and we feel uncomfortable. So that's dukkha. Now, a sadhu, uh, a, um, an enlightened person, is not affected by the uh, expansion and contraction of the consciousness because he doesn't identify with his mind. And uh, his senses are not hankering for the objects of the, of, uh, of the senses also. So, with an ordinary person, they are hankering for sense gratification, and if due to passion, and if someone obstructs their sense gratification, then this this uh, lust, this hankering, which is coming from the mode of passion, being frustrated, turns destructive into the mode of ignorance, and that is called anger. So here, Chitraketu Maharaj is saying that the Supreme Lord, being transcendental, having transcendental senses, has no uh, attachment to things in the material world. If he, if therefore his, uh, he cannot have a material desire which is obstructed, which could have the possibility to turn into anger. So by establishing that the Supreme Lord is transcendental, he has transcendental senses, he is detached from any worldly object, and therefore. He is, there cannot be a pursuit of a worldly object that can be obstructed to even turn into anger. So, in this way, Chitraketu Maharaj is giving an argument that God is not angry and doesn't want to... It's not that when people are suffering in this world that God is punishing them because He's angry with them. This is a very anthropomorphic uh, concept and a material concept of God. So, that's being uh, rejected here. So Sri Krishna is saying, Samoham Sarva Bhuteshu, Name Dvestosti Na Priha. I am equal to everyone, I am not for or against anyone. Ye Bhajanti Tumam Bhaktya Maite Teshu Chapyaham. In these uh, second two lines, the, the uh, word tu is, is here, and the word uh, tu here means but, however, and it's used to indicate that the next words will give a contrasting case. And the contrasting case here is that the Supreme Lord is not impartial in relation to His devotees. Hmm? He is impartial in relation to the living entities, but not in relation to His, to his devotees. Now, if God is imp impartial in relation to the people of this world, then one might, and uh, their suffering is not God's punishment or their happiness is not really God's blessing, then why do they experience happiness and distress? So the answer is, it is the karma fal, the fruit of their own activities. So God is not responsible for that. The material energy is uh, working in such a way to bring the fruit of good and bad activities. 
Though the mature energy cannot work without the glance of the Lord, that is, the Supreme Lord is the Nimitta current, the uh, instrumental cause of the, of the cosmic manifestation. Uh, just like a person can uh, turn on a, the electricity switch, but he is not responsible for what happens that the electricity will make uh, heat in the, in the heater and will make uh, cool air in the, in the air conditioner. That's, not, uh, that's up to the arrangement of, of the room. But the person who activates everything, he just turns on the electricity. So similarly, the Supreme Lord being Nimitakan, he glances towards Maya, and then Maya is activated, and the living entities undergo their happiness and distress according to the, the samskars, the impressions in the Mahatattva, in the uh, subtle material energy uh, that have come from their own past activities. So, uh, the example is given of the sun. The sun is shining equally on everyone. However, it gives happiness to the Padma, to the Kamal, to the lotus flower. And it gives happiness to the Chakravak bird. Because at night, the Chakravak birds, the, the male and female, they're separated from each other and they cry in the night in separation. But then when the sun rises in the morning, then they meet and the, they feel happiness. And the, the Kamal, the lotus flower that was closed at n night, when the sun rises, becomes full of joy. So the sun... Is, it seems is partial to the Chakravaka bird and partial to the Kama, the lotus flower, because it's giving joy to them. But it, it seems that the sun is against the Kumud. The Kumud is the night blooming lily. So uh, the, it's, a, it's a night lotus. So when the sun, the, the, in the moonshine, the Kumud is blossoming. But when the sun shines, then the Kumud closes. Hmm. And also the, the, the uh, owl, the owl is flying around at night very happily. But then when the sun rises, the, the owl doesn't uh, tolerate the light and disappears into his hole in the tree. So it seems that the same sun has favoritism to the lotus flower and to the chakrak bird and is against the owl and is against the uh, night blooming lotus. But this is not true. The sun is the same. He's just shining everywhere. And those various recipients of the rays of the sun react and experience happiness and distress due to their own acquired nature. And so in the same way, Krishna is saying, Samuham Sarvabhuteshu Name Dvesti Priya I am equal to everyone. I am not favoring or discriminating against anyone. But all the people of the world some are enjoying and some are suffering and they're changing places and this is going on uh, due to their own swabhav, their own sanskars, the reactions of their own activities. Hmm. So, but then see Krishna is saying, Ye bhajanti tu mam bhaktya, but those who render service to me, they are in me and I am in them. So, that means that when the Supreme Lord does show partiality, He does show partiality, it is always in relation to bhakti. It's in relation to devotion. For example, when Hiranyakashipu took over the universe, then, uh, at that time, the demigods were very much afraid and they took shelter of Him. And... At that time, the Supreme Lord said to them, when this demon begins to uh, tease, begins to give uh, problems to my devotee Prahlad Maharaj, then I will appear at once and kill him. So the Supreme Lord takes the position, in one sense, of a, of a, a nemesis, of an of, of a enemy towards the, the demons. But it's not because the demon is bad. The demon is only in the gunas. So those gunas cannot stir up any emotion in the Supreme Lord who is beyond the gunas. But then why does he uh, fight against Hiranyakashipu? So the answer is because of his loving relationship with Prahlad Maharaj. 
We see in the case of Ambarish Maharaj and Durvasa. Durvasa Rishi tried to kill uh, Ambarish Maharaj and the Supreme Lord saved Ambarish Maharaj and he, uh, his chakra chased after Durvasa Rishi and when Durvasa Rishi came to him and begged for mercy then the Supreme Lord was he was neutral to him he, he was neglecting him actually so whenever the Supreme Lord is acting in a way that seems to be inimical or to neglect someone or is showing favor to someone it's never because of the dualities of this world it's because his heart which cannot be moved by Sattva, Rajas and Tamas is being moved by Bhakti by devotion mm -hmm. now one may say all right I accept that the Supreme Lord is impartial in relation to the ordinary living entities but he has partiality towards the devotees so that's still a fault in him so then one can say no no in this regard the Supreme Lord he is like um, he can be compared to a kalpa briksha, a desire tree a desire tree is impartial if someone will Im approach a desire tree and say oh wish fulfilling tree please uh, give me this give me this wealth or give me this uh, food or this uh, clothing or this uh, chariot or kingdom or whatever it is then according to the request of the person the wish fulfilling tree will give that but the wish fulfilling tree will not fulfill the wishes of those who don't take shelter of him the fact that he fulfills the desires of those who take shelter of him but he doesn't fulfill the desires of those who don't sh take shelter of him is not his partiality but it is due to the behavior of those who are approaching or not approaching him so Krishna has said in chapter 4 yeya tamam parpadyante tangstataiva bajamyaham that as all surrender to me I reciprocate with them accordingly so uh, the Supreme Lord is impartial anyone who will approach him anyone who will take shelter of him in for in whichever mood he will always reciprocate according to that mood and therefore his reciprocation with the devotees is not the defect of partiality but rather it is his ornament it is his glory but still we can say that the supreme lord is even superior to a desire tree why is that because when a person approaches a, a kalpa vriksha he asks for something and he takes it then he goes away then the desire tree forgets about that person but see Krishna is not like that when his devotees take shelter of him with devotion then Bhagavan Bhakta Bhaktiman it is said that the Supreme Lord ha ha is a devotee of his devotee Bhagavan Bhakta Bhaktiman the Supreme Lord is full of devotion for his devotee so the desire tree never becomes attached to the persons who take his shelter but Krishna becomes attached very strongly to his devotees in fact Krishna himself in the 11th canto of Srimad Bhagavatam in uh, chapter uh, 2 verse 55 then see Krishna speaking a very famous verse excuse me Visrijati ridayam nayasya sakshad dhari avasa bito pyauga nasha pranaya rasanaya dhritangri padma sabhavati bhagavata pradana ukta here see Krishna is describing his relationship with a devotee who never forgets him even for one second because that devotee never forgets Krishna even for one second so then Krishna says visrijati radhyamna yasya sakshat that the Supreme Lord he is ava, avasha abhito pyo goga nashaha he's so pure he's so powerful that if a person will just call his name 
even the person is an ordinary person trapped in material existence and suddenly he slips and he's falling from a cliff and just helplessly he says, Oh Krishna, Apanasam Sistim Goram, Yan Nama Viva So Grinam, Tato Sadhyavi Muchida, Yadvi Beti Swambayam. Even the living beings who are entangled in the complicated meshes of birth and death, if they will helplessly just call out his name once, they will immediately be delivered. So that's how powerful he is. Hmm? Though it's very, it's impossible for a living entity to escape from the bondage of this world. But Krishna is so powerful, he can immediately remove all the bondage of material existence from a person who calls his name, even just in a helpless condition. Hmm? But that very person, Pranaya Rasanaya Dhritangri Padma, he himself becomes bound. How? Pranaya Rasanaya, by the rope of love. His lotus feet are bound within the heart of the devotee, Visrijati Ridayam Nayasya, and he cannot give up that devotee. He cannot leave that devotee, even for a moment. He's there very attentively. Uh, uh, in a mood of service to that devotee and always living in his heart. So he's saying, Sa Bhavati Bhagavata Pradhan Ukta, that devotee who has bound the lotus feet of Krishna in his heart with a rope of love is called Bhagavat Pradhan, the, the chief the, uh, among all the great Bhagavat devotees. So See, Krishna, here in this verse of Bhagavad Gita, says, uh, My devotees are in me and I am in them, means that we are attached to each other. And the relationship is given like the Mani Kanchan Nyai. Mani Kanchan Nyai means the logic of the jewel and the gold. So Mani Kanchan Nyai, it... it, it this logic indicates two things in this in regard to Sri Krishna and his devotees. First of all, if there's a, um, a chintamani, it can produce gold. If someone wants gold, it can produce the gold. So in the same way, if someone takes shelter of Sri Krishna, then from Sri Krishna comes his Swarup Shakti, his internal potency and enters uh, through his, the, the, his devotees, through the parampara, and into the heart of that devotee. And now the devotee becomes like gold. Hmm? So just as gold has come from the jewel, so in the same way, the devotion in the heart of the devotee is Krishna's own Swarup Shakti. So that is one aspect of this example, Manikanchanyai, the logic of the jewel and the gold. And another meaning is that gold is beautiful and the jewel is beautiful. But when the jewel is set in gold, then it really shines and the jewel becomes more beautiful and the gold also becomes more beautiful. So in the same way, the uh, glory of the devotee is uh, his that see Krishna loves him so much and is always serving him. That's the glory of the devotee. And the glory of Krishna is that the devotee loves him so much and is always serving him. So the devotee becomes more glorious by the association and love of Krishna. And Krishna becomes more glorious by the association and love of his devotees. And both of them, they become more glorious and more beautiful. So there's a, there's a mutual relationship of enhancement uh, just like a, a, a jewel and gold. So here see Krishna saying, I am in them and they are in me. He's speaking about this deep attachment uh, to of himself and his devotee. He's just hinting at that. But we see that in Bhagavad Gita, the actual details of the greatness, uh, of the, 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 the Jeevan Chirtra, the life histories of the devotees, which are so full of nectar, 
uh, they only spoke, they, they're not, um, let us say, they're not uh, elaborated upon, they're only spoken of in terms of a few general principles we find in Bhagavad Gita. So it's for this reason that uh, Arjun later, when Krishna, after the battle of Kurukshetra, Krishna spoke in the Bhagavad Gita, battle of Kurukshetra is won, and uh, Yudhishthira Maharaj becomes the emperor of the world, and then see Krishna, he returns to Dwarka. So at that time, Arjun was filled with regret. Once, Nard Muni, he came to Hastinapur, because he was looking for the uh, greatest recipient of Sri Krishna's mercy. And Hanuman had told Narad Muni, I am not uh, a, a recipient of the mercy of the Lord. You know who's really received the mercy of the Lord? The Pandavas. You should go and see them. So then Narad, he set off for Dwarka. And uh, as he arrived there, he saw that the Pandavas, Yudhisthira Maharaj, Bhimsain, Arjun, Nakul Sahadev, uh, Draupadi, Kunti, they were having a meeting together and they were discussing. Yudhisthira Maharaj was saying, we have to have some, make a big sacrifice uh, uh, to make an excuse for Krishna to come here because uh, now he's gone far away to Dwarka. So Yudhisthira Maharaj was realizing, was, was revealing uh, that Yudhisthira Maharaj is, is revealing uh, through his words, that the reason he's doing everything, the reason he was making his Rajasuga Yagya to become the emperor, was not for his own aggrandizement, but it was just a pretext, an excuse uh, to invite Krishna, and uh, uh, that Krishna would come and he would have Krishna's association the opportunity to have his darshan and serve him. So when Narada Muni arrived, he was in great ecstasy and he was glorifying all. Oh, you are the devotees of that Krishna who is so merciful, so glorious. We see that when Lord Nishingadev came to this world, he killed Hiranyakashipu. And in, uh, in the form of Varadev, he killed Hiranyaksha. In the form of Lord Ramachandra, he killed the um, Kumbhakarna and Ravana. But they, those persons, they didn't get liberated. But Krishna is so merciful. Putana and Shishupal and others who were killed by Krishna, they were all liberated. When Lord Nishinga Dev came in this world, he gave love to Prahlad Maharaj, but he didn't distribute love to others. When Lord Ramachandra came in this world, he exchanged love with Hanuman and Vibhishan, but he did not freely uh, distribute love uh, as Sri Krishna has done. When Sri Krishna came in this world, he was distributing love even to living entities in the mode of ignorance, such as trees and creepers. When Sri Krishna uh, went to Kurukshetra uh, at the time of the solar eclipse, at that time, all the sages of the world who were there in Lord Ram's Leela, like Vishwamitra Muni, Vashishta Rishi and Gautam Rishi, Mm? Then they met with Krishna in Kurukshetra and seeing him they received his mercy and they all became pure devotees. So Krishna is more merciful than Lord Narayan, more merciful than Lord Nishingadev, more merciful than Lord Ramachandra. And in this way Narad Muni's tongue was uncontrollably because his tongue is a kirti lampat. Kirti lampat means greedy to relish the glories of Krishna. His tongue was spontaneously chanting the glories of Krishna. But then Nard Muni caught his tongue, getting carried away. And he said, O tongue! And he bit his tongue. <clears throat> and he stopped his tongue from speaking. <laughs> and he said, O tongue! So, you're glorifying the Supreme Lord Krishna, are you? Meaning that, or oh, even Anantashesh with a million mouths, he cannot... Uh, touch the glories of, of Sri Krishna, cannot come to the end of them, cannot adequately articulate them. And uh, so it is not uh, possible to fathom the glories, to even understand the depths of the glories, let alone describe them. So Narad Muni, he bit his tongue and he chastised his tongue. And he said, Oh, so you want to speak the glories of Supreme Lord? 
It will be more fortunate for you if you can speak the glories of his devotees. And so then Narad began to speak the glories of Arjuna and the Pandavas. The confidential meaning of this is, first of all, that bhakti is the self-manifest. It is uh, spontaneous. So Narad Muni could not control his, uh, his tongue. His tongue was spontaneously glorifying the Lord and he had to bite it to stop it. But then he said, Oh my dear tongue, you will be, I will consider that you are fortunate if you can glorify Krishna's devotees. Now the confidential meaning is this. And that is that the glories of Supreme Lord are completely transcendental and unlimited. And the glories of the devotees are also completely transcendental and also unlimited. But because Narad Muni himself is a bhakta, he is a devotee, so from his own experience, he has some insight into nature of the devotees. So he can glorify them to some degree. And then another meaning is that Due to one's limited capacity, one may not be able to adequately glorify the Supreme Lord or adequately glorify the devotees, and one may make some mistake even. But the devotees are more merciful than the Supreme Lord, so if you glorify them and make some mistake or some offense, then they will uh, readily forgive you and give you a blessing. And in this way, speaking the glories of the devotees is more beneficial, more powerful and more uh, purifying than the speaking the glories of the Supreme Lord. So then Narada Muni began to glorify uh, Arjun and the Pandavas. Oh, how... Uh, see Krishna, he used to come to the palace of the Pandavas, even uh, Brahma and so many demigods they find it difficult to have the darshan of Krishna even in their trance. But Krishna wanted to go to their palace and have their darshan. See, Krishna was very humble. In the Rajasura sacrifice, Krishna was washing the feet of the guests of Yudhisthira Maharaj when they ar arrived. He accepted that service because no one had volunteered to ha do the foot washing reception of the guests. So Krishna himself volunteered. Krishna himself what used to be the driver of the chariot of Arjun. And Krishna has spoken the Bhagavad Gita, which is the essence of all the Upanishads also to Arjun. So in this way, Narada Muni was saying to the Pandavas, Oh, you are truly the uh, greatest recipients of the Lord's mercy. So hearing this, Arjun, he said, It is, it is not true that I have received the Lord's mercy. And why is that? Because if you have a relationship or friendship with someone, then the very nature, nature of this mitrata, this friendship, is hitakari. Hitakari. You always act for the benefit of your friend and you act in such a way as to give happiness to your friend. But Arjun said, Krishna has acted in such a way that he has given me nothing but sadness. Hmm? Why is that? Because before the battle of Kurukshetra, I said to see Krishna, O oh Krishna, you have taken a vow not to take up weapons in this battle. So why are you so eager to come into the battle on my chariot? and uh, go and face all the warriors on this battlefield. But see, Krishna, he would not, uh, he would not um, give up his insistence that he would drive my chariot. Arjun said, even, I fell down at his feet and I held on to his feet and I begged him, please, don't come, don't drive my chariot in this battle. But still, see, Krishna insisted. And so he drove my chariot in the battle. And in that battle we had to face very powerful warriors like uh, Karna and uh, Bhishma, Bhishma Dev and Drona Charya who had such powerful weapons 
arrows that could pierce my armor, that could pierce my heart. And see Krishna being on the chariot. He faced all of those weapons. And he took all of those weapons on his own body. Which is as soft as a lotus flower. Extremely tender. And when I remember how Krishna took all these weapons on his own soft body. Driving my chariot. Then I become filled with grief even to this day. So what is the question of being merciful and being uh, showing friendship to me? I agree that He gave mercy, but this mercy that He gave was only a cause of suffering to me. So this cannot be considered a very high class of mercy. On that battlefield, Bhishma Dev was there. And Bhishma, he was shooting the arrows. And that Bhishma, he is a Shushka Gyani, a dry Gyani. And he, is the, he has Dharma Nishta. He's fixed in doing his Dharma. And he's also a devotee. So that means that uh, Bhishma Dev in this Leela is playing the role of the devotee, uh, the, the, of the person who's following Krishna's instructions that we're discussing today. Yat Kodosi, Yat Asnasi, Yat Josi, Dadasi, Yat. Whatever you do, whatever you offer, everything, you do that for me. Bhishma Dev, he's following that. He's a devotee, but he's also uh, playing the role of a person who is very fixed in doing his karma without attachment to the result and offering everything to Sri Krishna. So the result of that is that one attains perfection in bhakti, but that uh, perfection in bhakti is filled with Aishwarya Gyan. So, Arjun was saying that Shuska Gyani, that dry Gyani Bhishma Dev, who was fixed in his Dharma, because he's thinking, oh, Krishna is Bhagavan, he cannot be injured by any material weapons, so let me shoot my arrows at him. Uh, where, is the, where is the love in this? So, those who have pure Kevala Bhakti, unalloyed devotion, then uh, they are always very concerned that Krishna should not be hot, he should not be too cold, he should be comfortable, he, let us massage him, let us fan him, let us bring very delicious preparations, and they want to pamper him in all ways. Mm -hmm. So, Arjun was remembering on the battlefield how see Krishna was uh, taking the arrows of Arjun, of the Bhishma Dev, and Arjun was regretting this very much. He was thinking, he was driving my chariot, uh, actually not really out of mercy for me, but actually it, he wanted to do the Bhuvi Bara Harana, to take away the burden of the earth, the, to uh, make sure that all the warriors who were demonic, like Duryodhana and others, they were all destroyed. It was for this reason. So, here Arjun is making a distinction between the bhakti that comes from uh, the practicing bhakti mixed with the Varnashram Dharma and very, his own very natural bhakti as seeing Krishna as his Priya Saka, his, his dear friend. So then one may say, but Arjun, Krishna has spoken to you the Bhagavad Gita. Then Krishna said, yes, yes, he has spoken these words just to cheat me. Why? Because I always think of him and serve him as my dear friend. And he has spoken to me about um, Sharanagati, taking shelter of the Supreme Lord out of fear of material existence. He has spoken about uh, practicing the devotion which is mixed with the Dharma Nishta, having fixity in one's Dharma. He has said, Sarva Dharmam Prichadya, and uh, Mame Kam Shanam Braja, surrender to me, I'll protect you from the sinful activities. But for the devotees who are 
whose hearts are always melting in love for Sri Krishna, who see him in a in a relationship of friendship or more than that, then these instructions are quite dry and uh, they have no taste in that at all. So, in the verse we're discussing today, Ye bhajanti tumam bhaktya me te te shuchapyaham Krishna is saying, I am equal to everyone, but those who serve me with devotion, then I am in them and they are in me. That means we live together and they have bound me with a rope of love in the core of their hearts and I can never uh, give them up. Really, this is the, uh, uh, the goal of life. And uh, that bhakti, kevala bhakti, is superior to the fruit of Vaidhi Bhakti in the form of love for God but with Aishwarya Gyan. I want to speak a few words about Janavata Kurani. In Gauragana Desha Deepika it is described that just as Supreme Lord uh, Narayan has his Shaktis uh, Bhu, Sri and Nila so all the Incarnations of the Supreme Lord have, are accompanied by their various Shaktis. So, uh, when Balaram Prabhu appears in this world, his two Shaktis are Varuni and Revati. And uh, Revati is the uh, daughter of Kukudmi Maharaj. So, similarly, when Krishna appears in this world as Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, then Balaram appears in this world as Nityananda Prabhu, and the two Shaktis of Balaram, that is Varuni and Revati, they appear in this world as uh, Vasudha and Janava, that is the, the Shakti Varuni Devi appears as Vasudha and uh, Revati appears as Janava. So Vasudha and Janava were the two daughters of Surya Das Sarkal. Uh, Sarkal uh, was his title and it refers to the treasurer. He had a very high position in the government of the local king. He was the treasurer of the king. So the treasure is called Sar Sarkal. So uh, Surya Das Sarkal was the um, son of Kamsari Mishra and he had uh, his younger brother was the very famous devotee of Gauranitai, that is Gauri Das Pandit, the incarnation of Krishna's very dearest Priyanamasaka Subal. So, um, Surda Sakal, the father of Vasudha and, and Janava, he is himself an incarnation of Kakudmi. And uh, the mother of Janava Takarani, her name was uh, Badravati. Badravati. So she was born in the village of Shaligram, which is uh, quite close to uh, Navadip Dham. And uh, as she was growing up, and, sh and her and her elder sister came to, they were approaching their adolescence, so then the father is always concerned about, I have to find the right husband for my daughters. So one day, uh, a Brahmin uh, approached uh, Surida Saka and told him, Oh, do you know that the brother of Krishna, Balaram, has appeared uh, in the village of Ekachakra as the son of Hadai Pandit and Padmavati. And in his uh, boyhood, he went on pilgrimage to all the holy places and he became a very learned uh, scholar and he's doing pastimes as a great devotee. So, he is Lord Balaram himself, and your two daughters are his Shaktis, uh, Varuni and uh, Revati. So, you should uh, arrange the marriage of your daughters with that very Nityananda Babu, and right now he's staying in Navadweep in the house of Srivas Thakur. So, when Surda Sakul heard this advice, he, con he was thinking about it very deeply until late at night and then he fell asleep. 
And then in his dream, he had the darshan of Lord Balram. And Balram was so effulgent and decorated with divine jewels, and he was with his two shaktis, Varuni and the Revati. And then he saw Balram became Nityananda Prabhu, and his two shaktis were Surya Sakul's own two daughters. So then, when Surya Sakul woke up, he was very, very eager. I must arrange the marriage of my daughters with this Nityananda Prabhu. So then, he sent a Brahmin to um, Navadvip to uh, bring this proposal to uh, Srivast Thakur because Srivast Thakur and Malini, his wife Malini, they are very much like the adopted parents of uh, Nityananda Prabhu. So marriage is always negotiated through the parents. So when uh, Srivast Thakur heard this news, he was very enthused and he agreed, Malini agreed, he told Advaita Charya, Advaita Charya was also uh, very uh, happy about this. So then uh, Nityananda Prabhu came with a big Harinam Sankirtan party to Shalagram. And uh, all devotees there, they were overwhelmed to see Nityananda Prabhu and his Harinam Sankirtan party. And when Surya Sakul offered his two daughters to Nityananda Prabhu, then that very darshan he had in the dream of Balaram with Revati and Varuni, he saw that, and then they became Nityananda Prabhu and his daughters again. So, mm, after the wedding, Nityananda Prabhu bought Janava Thakurani and Vasudha back to Navadweep uh, to meet with Sachimata. And Sachimata was so overjoyed because her son um, Nimai, he had left home and taken sannyas many years before. And uh, Balaram was like another son uh, to Sachimata. In fact, Vishwarup. Nityananda was like. Yes, Nityananda is Balaram. Vishwarup, Sachimata's uh, eldest son, when he disappeared, he'd entered into the body of Nityananda Prabhu. So Nityananda Prabhu, it, she was experienced as if her son had come home and he'd bought his new wives. So Sachimata was very lovingly embracing the Vasudha and embracing uh, Janava. And they were so young and sweet, she could not resist to pinch their cheeks and show them so much affection. So. Uh, they also went then to uh, Sachimata said uh, go to Shantipur for some time so then uh, Nityanabhu and his two wives went to Shantipur and then Sita Takarani the wife of Advaita Charya also showered her love on Janava Takarani and, and Vasudha and then afterwards uh, Nityanabhu took them and they established their um, Sri Pat their, their home in Kardaha. So many years passed by and Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu he left this world. Nityananda Prabhu also left this world. Shiva's Thakur, Sachimata, Advaita Chaitanya, they all left this world. And at that time um, after some time very prominent devotees appeared, such as Srila Naratam Das Thakur, Srinivas Acharya, Shamananda Pandit, Ramachandra Kaviraj, and others. So, in the village where Srila Naratam Das Thakur was born, the king of that uh, area, he uh, decided to organize a huge festival to celebrate Gorpunima. And one night, when Janava was, Takarani was in Kardaha, she had a dream. And in her dream, she saw Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu told her, I want you to go and attend this festival in Katuri. Mm -hmm. And there in the Kirtan, I myself will appear again, along with my associates, Nityananda Prabhu, Advaita Acharya, Shiva's Thakur, and others, Rupa Goswami, Sanatan Goswami. So then when Janava Thakurani woke up, she was very enthusiastic to go and attend this famous, uh, which has now become very famous, 
festival in Katuri. It was the first big Gorupanim festival, uh, which was observed by devotees from Navadweep, from Jagannath Puri, and from Brandavan. They all assembled together there. So, Janava Thakurani set out from Kardaha with many associates and visited many places along the way. So, in her entourage, there were great devotees uh, like Raghunandan, like uh, Raghupati Upadhyay, such as Brindavan Das Thakur and um, Srinivas Acharya and many others were in this Sankirtan party of Janava Thakurani. So as she was uh, traveling on the way, she again came to Navadweep and she came to the house of Jagannath Mishra. And she saw that it was empty. And she was weeping bitterly, remembering how just after her marriage, Sachimata had shown her so much affection. She went to the house of Srivas Pandit and there she was greeted by Srivas Thakur's younger brothers who were still alive. But she saw that Srivas Thakur was no longer there, Malini was no longer there. And she was weeping so much in separation. Then Janava Thakurani, she went to Shantipur and Advaita Charya and Sita Thakurani had passed away and she was remembering them. So it was a tremendously emotional experience that she had on her way to Keturi. Her separation mood was inflamed so much by seeing the empty house of Sachimata, Srivas Thakur and Advaita Charya. But remembering the words that Mahaprabhu had said in a dream, she came to Katuri with a great hope. And there, on the day before Gorpanim, the day in which there would be an installation of six deities uh, that would be overseen by Janava Thakurani and the actual Prampatishta, all the rituals would be performed by Srinivas Acharya. So on the day before, uh, they had very mm, great Harinam Sankirtan and then uh, the the next day when the uh, deities were uh, installed and the first offering of, of boga is made to them Janava Thakurani went to the kitchen and she prepared so many delicious preparations herself and that was the first offering to Radharaman and um, Radha Kanta and uh, Gauranga and uh, Radha Krishna and uh, the, all the six deities on that day. So then there was a, again very tremendous kirtan and in that kirtan as promised Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu appeared. Nityananda Prabhu she had darshan of her husband Nityananda Prabhu, Advaita Acharya Sita Thakurani, all the associates of Mapu appeared in that kirtan. Srila Haridas Thakur appeared there. Even Raghunath Das Goswami, who was still alive, but was too old to come from Vrindavan, he appeared there, along with Rupa Goswami and Sanatan Goswami, who had already left this world. Yeah. And all the devotees were in great joy. But then, all those personalities disappeared. And there was a great chaos. Everyone was crying. The... Um, sons of Advaita Charya, when he disappeared from this world, they were crying. Jayanilo Premadana Karuna Prachu Heno Prabhu Kotagela Acharya Thaku. Oh, where did Advaita Charya, who had brought Marpa Witness to this world, where did he go? Kahamora Swarupa Kasanata. In this way, Srila Narutam Das Thakur has written a beautiful song describing the chaos and the pain of separation of the devotees as they're weeping. Uh, oh, where is my Rupa Goswami? Where is my Sanatan Goswami? Where is my Raghunathas Goswami? Where did the great golden dancer Goranga Mahapu suddenly disappear? 
I will smash my head against the stone and I will enter into fire. So, Srila Nartam Dastaku, who is an eyewitness of this astonishing event, has uh, written a song about it, a Jaini Lo Premadana, that we sing on the disappearance days. So, after this wonderful festival, then Janava Takarani set off for Vrindavan. So, with her great Sankirtan party, with so many famous devotees, she was uh, singing and dancing through many villages uh, on the way to Vrindavan. One day she entered a village where the people were uh, dedicated to the service of Chandi, the form of uh, they worship Durga, who is carrying many weapons and with her tongue out, and they offer meat and wine. So very um, fallen and tamasic persons, devotees of Chandi, were there. But when Janava Takarani came, she was so beautiful. Some of the villagers thought, who is that woman? She is so beautiful. Is, is that Chandi herself? That Chandi has come to see us? And they spoke with their, with their friends. Others of their friends says, how dare you compare our goddess Chandi to an ordinary mm, mm, being? And especially these Vaishnavas, they are so foolish. They never worship Chandi, they are offensive. So comparing her to Chandi is a great offense. You should go to the temple and pray. Uh, for her forgiveness. So then the villagers went to the temple deity of Chandi and they prayed, Oh, we have made offense. Goddess Chandi, we are your devotees. Please forgi forgive us and just kill all these stupid Vaishnavas who are, don't never serve you. <laughs> <laughs> so then later that night, when all the villagers, they went to sleep in a dream, they saw Chandi and she was furious and she grabbed each one experience that she had grabbed them and raised the sword and said to them, Oh, don't you know that this Vaishnavi you have seen, she is actually the Shakti of Balaram Prabhu, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, and you have made offense to her and all the devotees. So I am never pleased by this. I'll cut you to pieces and uh, make you suffer for millions of lifetimes unless you go and beg for forgiveness from Janava Thakurani and all the Vaishnavas. So then, all those villagers, simultaneously, they woke up from their vision of Chandi. And then they met together, and they went, and they begged forgiveness from the Vaishnavas. And then they took the villagers to Janava Takarani, and they fell at her feet. And she blessed them, and they all became pure devotees, by the mercy of Janava Takarani. So Janava Takarani is very, very merciful. As she continued, tra uh, continued traveling on her way to Vrindavan, then they were camping at one place, and at night they were having kirtan. And then when they finished the kirtan, everyone took rest. But in the meantime, there were some mm, dacoits. And the dacoits, they had been thinking, oh, these, uh, this traveling party, they must be carrying quite a lot of wealth with them. They probably have some jewels also. So they sent a spy. And the spy came back and said, Oh, now they've finished their Sankirtan and now they've taken rest. This is a good time to attack. So then the thieves w were so enthusiastic, they started running towards the camp of Janava Takarani. And they were running and running, but the more they ran, the further and further away the camp seemed to be. And they were sweating and getting out of breath, and the whole night they were running. And then this the sun began to rise in the morning and they still hadn't arrived at the camp. But they couldn't understand what was going on. So then the thieves, they got together in their, uh, their lair and the leader was thinking, what happened last night? We were so close, but running and running, we could not arrive there. And then he realized, oh, this Janava Takarani, must be a great personality. And being enlightened by her mercy, he began to consider all the sinful activities he'd done in his life, all the pain he'd given to other people, all the animals he'd killed, all his sins, intoxication, all illicit activities. He began to meditate on it and he could see that in the future he was going to go into a darkness of extreme suffering for the reaction of all these sinful activities. 
and he became afraid and he spoke his mind to the other thieves and they were also convinced by his sincerity so they all got up and they went to the camp of Janava Thakurani and weeping and begging for mercy they fell at her feet and Janava Thakurani must be blessed them and those dacoits also became pure devotees and then the fame of Janava Thakurani began to spread everywhere because how is it possible for such wicked persons to so quickly become saints? Janava Thakurani continued and she began to approach Vrindavan and as her big Sankirtan party was coming from one direction they first went to Mathura took bath in Vishram Ghat and had darshan of Adi Keshava and then on the road that goes from Mathura to Vrindavan they were approaching so it goes past Batrol and Akru Ghat so as they were approaching Akru Ghat from one side then the Vaishnavas of Vrindavan were approaching from another side that means Gopal Bhatta Goswami was still alive Srila Jiva Goswami Lokanath Das Goswami Bhugava Goswami and many others they were coming from the other direction so these devotees from Bengal they have heard of these great Goswamis of Vrindavan but many had never seen them and these Goswamis of Vrindavan had heard of Naratam, Srinivas, Shamananda, Janava Thakurani, uh, Chutananda, Vrindavan Das Thakur, their names were legendary, but they had never met them. And now these two big Sankirtan parties were coming and they met together at that place which is now the village Batro uh, by Akurogat. So there was a, a tremendous meeting, all were giving Dandavat Pranams to each other and embracing each other. How joyful it was! And then Srila Jiva Goswami and Srila Gopal Bhatta Goswami and others, they took Janava Thakurani for the darshan of uh, Madan Mohan, Govinda and Gopinath. And then from there she left and she went to Govardhan and she came to Radha Kund. There Radha Kund, Srila Raghunath Das Goswami was very old and very senior among the, the Goswamis. But when Raghunath Das Goswami saw Janava Thakurani, he bowed down at her lotus feet and Janava Thakurani seeing the Preojan Tattva Acharya full recipient of all the mercy of Sri Rupa Goswami and Yadunandan Acharya then Janava Thakurani also gave Pranam to Srila Raghunath Das Goswami and she stayed on the northern shore of Radhakund for three days so the place where she sat that is called Janava Baitak and you can go there her sitting place is still there today and while she was there doing bhajan on the bank of Radhakund she heard the sound of Krishna's flute playing and then she looked and she saw Radha and Krishna and she fainted she became unconscious as internally she entered into the Nitya Seva of Radha and Krishna so that place in, uh, in Radhakund which is called Janava Baitak it is there, that particular location, because from that side of Radhakund there's a bridge of crystals which crosses over the water to an island in the middle of Radhakund and there is a beautiful kunj that is called the uh, Swa, uh, Swananda Sukada Kunj. That is the kunj of, of Ananga Manjari. So though we have discussed that Janava Thakurani is Vasudha, uh, sorry, is um, the incarnation of Revati. But at the same time, you should know that Janava Thakurani is also the incarnation of Ananga Manjari. So, in the mood of Ananga Manjari, when she came to Radhakund, she was doing bhajan there because that's the entrance to the bridge where she eternally serves uh, Radha Krishna in Swananda Sukada Kunj. So, without the shelter of Nityananda Prabhu, because he is the master of Sandini Shakti, who can make the heart neat and clean and make it steady and remove all anartas, then without the mercy of Nityananda Prabhu, one cannot attain the mercy of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, who is the 
in combined form of Radha Krishna. And Janava Takarani is the Shakti of Nityananda Prabhu. She is the Shakti of Balaram. She is the embodiment of devotion to Nityananda Prabhu, the embodiment of devotion to Balaram. We know also that Balaram Prabhu or Nityananda Prabhu, they are the Akhanda Guru Tattva, the undivided, indivisible, original, wholesale, complete aggregate of all Guru Tattva. And Janava Thakurani is the transcendental embodiment of devotion to the Akanda Guru Tattva. And therefore, the mercy of Janava Thakurani is essential for us. Because without devotion to Sri Guru, no one can progress in Bhakti. And if one has Guru Nishta, unswerving, unflinching loyalty to Sri Guru, then all success will come in spiritual life. So on this day, we are praying, offering our prayers at the lotus feet of Janava Thakurani, that is incarnation of Revati. And more importantly for us, she is Ananga Mandri, Radharani's younger sister, under whose uh, guidance and by whose mercy one can attain the service of uh, Radha and Krishna in Radha Kund. So we're praying to her, O Janava Thakurani, O embodiment of devotion to the Akanda Guru Tattva, bless me with such devotion to my Gurudev and bless me that I can enter into the Nitya Seva of Radha and Krishna. So Srila Bhaktinath Thakur has written in his songbook, Sankalpa Kalpa Druma, a very beautiful prayer to Janava Thakurani. So we, we want to uh, sing this and uh, briefly explain. Bhava Navi Padi Mura Akula Parano Kisikula Pabutara Napai Samdan O oh, Janavata Kurani, I have fallen into this vast ocean of material existence. And therefore my Paran, that means the power of my senses, the power of every one of my thoughts even, is akul, completely agitated, completely disturbed. How will I cross over this ocean and reach the shore? Even when I try to discover and investigate some means to come out from this situation. I cannot find any way out. I don't even know which direction to go. Na ache karam bala Na hi jnana bala Jag yoga tap dharma Na ache samba In Gita, Krishna has been describing how the devotees can take some support from the performance of the Nishkam, Karma and Gyan. But Srila Bhaktinath Thakur is saying, Oh, this karma for such a fallen person like me has no strength. And the Gyan has no strength. The performance of sacrifices and yoga and austerities and prescribed duties, they have no power. I have no history of their performance. Nitanta dula bayami na jani santaro evi pade amare kari be udaro. I O Janava Devi, I am extremely weak. I am in this ocean and I don't know how to swim. How pathetic, how desperate is a person who is in the ocean who doesn't know how to swim? Hmm. Who will rescue me from this dreadful calamity? Vishaya kumbira tahi Vishana darshano Kamera taranga sada Kare ute chano Not only can I not swim, 
not only do I not know which way, which direction to move in, but also there are crocodiles in this water in the form of my attachment for sense gratification. And also there are tidal waves uh, which are blowing me here and there in the form of my own calm, my own worldly desires. Praktana vayura bega sahetena pari And the tremendous the hurricane is blowing. What is that? Praktan sanskar. The impressions of my past life activities are like a powerful wind and they're forcing me and forcing me onto the path of worldly activities. Kandiya asti ramana nadeki kandari My mind is unsteady and I am weeping and weeping. I cannot see anyone who will mm, deliver me from this situation. Therefore, O go Sri Janava Devi, Eda Seika Runa, Karo Ajini Jagune, Gucheo Jantrana. O Sri Janava Devi, please be merciful to this servant, not by any quality of my own but only because of the profuse abundance of your great virtues. Deliver me from this terrible torturous suffering. Oh Janavatakurani, O embodiment of all devotion to the Akanda Guru Tattva. O Janavata Karani, embodiment of dedication to Nityananda Prabhu. O Janavata Karani, incarnation of Ananga Manjari herself. I am taking shelter of your lotus feet. So I am very sure that you, your lotus feet are like a boat and for sure it is certain that you will take me across the ocean of material existence. To me Nityananda Shakti Krishna Bhakti Guru Eida Sekaraya Dana Padakalpataru O Janavata Kurani to me Nityananda Shakti, you are the power of Nityananda, Guru, Krishna Bhakti Guru. You are the Guru, the teacher of devotion to Krishna. You see, how Janavata Karani was very humble, how she was very kind to everyone, how she was going here and there always surrounded by devotees, absorbed in Harikatha and Harinam Sankirtan, how she was doing Parikrama, of Navadip Dham, visiting the house of Satyamata, Shiva's Thakura, Dwayta Acharya, and weeping in separation from Mahapu and his associates. She's showing us the path of spiritual life. So, Krishna Bhakti Guru, E Dasi Korohadan Padakal Pataru. Oh, kindly bestow in charity to me your lotus feet, which are Kalpataru. They are the wish fulfilling desire tree. Kota kota pamare re kare cho udaro thoma chadane aje ekangal chara. Oh Janava, how many wicked, useless, material persons have you delivered? So many. We have heard about them today. The thieves, the dacoits, the worshippers of Chandi, all oh, the uh, unwilling and um, offensive, sinful, tamasic persons you have delivered. How many? Many, many, many. And now one more such unqualified person, a beggar who is quite despicable, is taking shelter of your lotus feet from today. Janava Takorani Ki Jai.